Okay, we're up and running. Technical difficulties. So, as per usual, there's a little menti question to get you started and keep you distracted while I fight with my laptop. Um, I think we're mostly there now, so we'll kick off shortly. Um, and hopefully the, la the, the presentation will cooperate. We'll see how we go. <laughs> Let's make a start then. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. I also hope my battery lasts. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Hope you all had a good weekend. Um, so today we are going to be covering orbit maneuvers, which, as I said, closes out the kind of orbit mechanics sections pretty much that you're covering as part of this space systems course. Um, the next class that you'll do will be, so I think uh, somebody said next week is your reading week, is that right? Yeah. yeah, okay, so next week's reading week, so we've no classes, and then the week after, check those dates, it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely next week, right, and then the week after, um, you'll be doing propulsion systems, so obviously that'll be related to your maneuvers, but it kind of starts crossing over into the system elements, so looking at how you design your spacecraft and your propulsion systems. Um, the video that's playing on screen, which I know is a bit tricky to see, um, is a, a representation of the different um, maneuvers that Cassini did. So Cassini was a mission to study Saturn, um, and so this is uh, sort of cutely named the ball of yarn, and these were all of the many, many maneuvers that Cassini had to do in all of its flybys of Saturn. Okay, are we ready to get started? Yeah, good. Oh, no. <laughs> what is happening, computer? You're killing me. Don't do this. Just as I thought I had it working, why have you decided to freak out? Yeah. Correct. Ah! Okay. This is really not good. Let's see if this one will run. Okay, all right, we're on to slide two. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Okay, orbit maneuvers. All right, so. Today, um, basically, the outcomes that you're going to learn this week from orbit maneuvers is calculating the velocity changes that you need for impulsive maneuvers, thinking about the pros and cons of different types of maneuvers that we can use, and the other learning outcome is not what we're going to cover in class, but it's what you'll be doing with your GMAT coursework, is thinking about how you can use software to actually simulate orbit maneuvers as well. So let's start with the basics. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's quite helpful to understand the basics of orbit maneuvers and how they work. And I'm hoping this will help you remember how they work and what's going on when it comes to actually working out your different orbit maneuvers. So the fundamental principle 
of what all orbit maneuvers are built on is the idea that any orbit is uniquely defined by the position and velocity of the orbiting body at a given point. What do I mean by that? Let's say we have the Earth and we have a satellite in orbit around the Earth. At any moment in time, we can calculate where that satellite is and we can calculate what its velocity is. So the magnitude of that velocity, but also the direction, yeah? If we know that, we can then work out what that satellite orbit is. So even if we only have one measurement of its position and its velocity, we can work out what its orbit should be, assuming a two-body problem. Well, actually, technically assuming anything, but for sanity's sake, we'll stick with the two-body analogy. So thinking about what we know about Kepler's laws, we know that that satellite has to be moving in an elliptical or a circular orbit, right? Or a parabolic or a hyperbolic, but it has to be moving on one of these conic sections that we talked about. So we have an idea of what we're working with to begin with. And we know that the satellite has to be on the orbit, right? So where I had it before, the orbit was around the satellite. That's not going to work. It has to be sitting somewhere on the orbit, right? So we know the orbit has to pass through it at some point. I know I have animation there. I'm not coming out of this PowerPoint presentation for love nor money. So <laughs> we're just going to move on. We already know various other things about our orbits. If you think back to the orbit concepts that we started off with, we know that an orbit has to have a constant energy and that that energy is somehow related to the semi-major axis. So the energy that's in that orbit tells us how big or small it is. And we also know that we can calculate that energy by considering the kinetic and the potential energy that's in that orbit. So if we know our orbit radius at that point, and we know our velocity at that point, we can work out what our energy is at that point. And since we know that our energy has to be constant, we can then work out the semi-major axis of that orbit. So now we know we have an orbit that has to be elliptical or circular, it has to pass through our satellite, and we know what its semi-major axis has to be. Right? So we're part of the way there. We also know that whatever point the satellite is at, its velocity, has to be, its velocity vector has to be aligned with that point on the ellipse. Yeah? So if the satellite's velocity is pointing off like this direction, for example, then we know it's at the wrong point of the ellipse because it has to be following that orbit around. So basically, by knowing its position and its velocity, we can work out what size the orbit is that it's in, we know it has to intersect with it, and we know what direction it has to be moving. And in that way, we can work out exactly what orbit it has to be on just by knowing its position and velocity. What that means, basically, is that if we want to change a satellite's orbit, there's only really two things that we can change. Because as long as its position and velocity remain the same, it's on the same orbit. We can't change position because we already discussed the fact that we can't teleport, right? So we can't instantly jump to a new location. That's not allowed. Um, so the only thing we can do is change our velocity. And by changing our velocity, we have instantly created an entirely new orbital path, whether that's by changing the velocity's direction, by changing its magnitude, or by changing both. Does that make sense? So basically what I've shown here is you've got a satellite moving around with some little bit of velocity. If I increase the velocity, I now have to increase that orbit's energy, which means its semi-major axis has to get bigger and I've somehow magically got onto a new bigger orbit. It has to happen at a point where those two orbits, the original orbit that we were on and the new orbit intersect because we can't teleport, no teleporting allowed, rule number one, okay? So you're still in the same place, you haven't changed your position, but you've changed your velocity and that moves you onto a new orbit. But you will always come back through the point where you've completed that burn because they have to intersect. Questions on that? Nope, everybody's happy. Okay. As you move through this, I suspect this will come up again and again. So revisit this, make sure that you're happy with it. But this is basically the fundamentals of how satellite maneuvers happen. So different types of maneuvers that we can do. And a lot of you shouted these out in the why would we maneuver our orbits. So the first thing we might want to do is we might want to change our orbit size. So we might have launched into, you know, we might have gotten a launch vehicle and we've launched into an orbit and that orbit is like 
500 kilometers above the Earth's, uh, the Earth's surface. And we might decide, actually, we want to go further out. We want to head out to a geo orbit or something like that. So we want to get our satellite into a bigger orbit. So that might be one of the first things we want to do, change orbit size. We might want to change the orbit shape, so we might want to move into an eccentric orbit, like we talked about those highly elliptical orbits, or if we're in an elliptical orbit, we might want to turn it into a circular orbit so that we're getting a constant view of the Earth because we're always at the same altitude. We also might want to change our orbit orientation. So we might want to change our inclination. So we talked about these all with the hula hoop and pumpkin. Hopefully that's uh, memorable. Um, so we might want to change our orbit inclination, the tilt relative to the equator, or we might want to change its right ascension, so essentially its twist, much harder to represent in 2D, but again, hopefully you'll remember this from the pumpkin. Um, or we might want to change its argument of perigee. And the last thing we might want to change is our phase, or our true anomaly. So our true anomaly, we talked about, tells us instantaneously where our satellite is on its orbit, right? So it's changing really quickly as our satellite goes around its orbit. It's constantly moving from zero through 360 degrees and starting all over again. But what we might want to do is change the time that we pass, say, zero degrees. So we might want to slow our satellite down, or we might want to speed it up. And that's particularly useful if we want to do a rendezvous maneuver. So if, for example, we're in an orbit and there's another satellite in the same orbit as us, we'll never catch it because we're both moving at the same velocity around that orbit. So if we want to catch it, we need to change our phase within that orbit. So that's where this becomes particularly relevant. OK. Without further ado, I'm going to kick off some actual example orbits and work our way through these, unless there's any questions on that sort of foundational stuff, because it's important to get it clear in your head now. We're going on to actual orbit maneuvers. We're going on to actual orbit maneuvers. Is everybody a bit sleepy this Monday morning? Yeah. Well, you've got a reading week next week. Woo! So. I'm definitely going to use it to revise everything. <laughs> Good. All right, OK. Uh, everybody ready to move on and look at some orbit maneuvers? Everyone excited? I'd like at least a nod. It might just get some blood moving in your head, right? OK? Because I can see this is, not, this is not a lively class. Come on, right. Are you ready? OK, good. All right, let's go for it. OK. So the first thing I want to talk about are what we call coplanar maneuvers. So coplanar maneuvers basically just means maneuvers that happen in the same orbit plane. So when we talk about changing orbit planes, that involves tilting our orbit in some way. So that might be changing our inclination, changing our right ascension, but we're moving the plane, that 2D plane, if you want, that our satellite is moving in. Co-plane our maneuvers is when we're staying in that orbit plane. So our inclination, our right ascension, those things aren't changing. And basically what that gives us the option to do is to change our orbit size, so change our semi-major axis, or change our orbit's shape, change its eccentricity. And so basically, I, I've not put in all the possible permutations here because it would take up half the slide, but it could be moving from a circle to an ellipse, or moving from an ellipse to an ellipse, or moving from an ellipse to a circle. You get the idea. So we've got our satellite. It's in a little low circular orbit around the Earth, happy as Larry. And then we decide we want to change its orbit. So as I say, the first thing is that we have to have an orbit that intersects with that orbit. And if we're already in a circular orbit, there's no other circular orbit that can intersect with that orbit. Because a circular orbit has to have the planet at the center. So therefore, the circle would have to be bigger. And it couldn't cross paths. So if we're in a circular orbit and we're going to apply a maneuver, it's always going to move us into an ellipse. Now, I say always, this is when we're dealing with impulsive maneuvers. So this is when we've got something like a chemical propulsion system, a high thrust propulsion system, a firework, and we give it a big bang, and we get instantaneous change in velocity. Obviously, it's not actually instantaneous. It might happen over the course of a few seconds. But in the, in the, in the sort of length of an orbit, where you've got 90 minutes, a few seconds is very, very small. We'll talk a little bit next time about an alternative option to that. But for everything we're talking about today, we're talking about impulsive orbits, so immediate changes in velocity. All right? 
So we're at this point, we decide to change our velocity from velocity one, whatever we start off with, to velocity two, which means we're now magically on a new orbit because we've got a new velocity, the same location, but because of that, it's no longer on that same orbit because remember, it's uniquely defined by velocity and, and position. So as soon as we change that velocity, we're onto a new orbit. So to do that, we apply a thrust in one direction with our thrusters, and we're going to get a change in velocity in the opposite direction, right? So in this case, it's moving the same direction that the satellite was already rotating. We've thrusted out the back to add something to our velocity, so we've increased our velocity. And that change in velocity is what we call delta V. So if we had a velocity initially of 7 kilometers a second, and we add a velocity of 1 kilometer a second, we get a new velocity of 8 kilometers a second, and that delta V is our one kilometer per second that we've added in. And that then moves us onto this new orbit where our satellite will happily potter around until we do something else to change it. And we could equally do that moving from a bigger ellipse to a smaller ellipse or a smaller ellipse to a bigger ellipse. And that delta V is literally just the difference between the two velocities at that point. So it has to be at the same point where you apply that maneuver and it's the difference in velocity. So the satellite on that circular orbit will have had one velocity, but on the elliptical orbit will have had a different velocity, and the difference is the delta V. And this is basically all of the, the sort of fundamentals um, of what we use when we're planning orbit maneuvers, is calculating what that delta V will be, right? Because that's what we need to know as mission planners. So I want you just to, uh, actually I'm going to skip that one because we've already faffed around with the internet for too long, so skip that one and we'll move on to the next thing. So the second thing I just want to cover really briefly is uh, escape maneuvers, because we talked about parabolas and hyperbolas, and a lot of people were saying how they're a bit confusing and they don't make a ton of sense. Um, so an escape transfer is when we're moving now from a circle or an ellipse onto a parabolic trajectory, right? So we're moving from a closed orbit that always keeps us trapped around our planet into an open orbit where we can head off into deep space. Uh, and if you remember, when we traveled around, it's exactly the same thing. We apply a delta V, and now we can move on to our new parabolic trajectory, right? So it's exactly the same idea. So I'm just going to go back. So that's the kind of ideas of what we're doing. We can move from one orbit to another just by calculating what our velocity was in our initial orbit and what our velocity is on our second orbit. So thinking about the case we had before, where we had a satellite on a circular orbit, I know it's now an ellipse, but anyway, bear with me. We had a satellite on a circular orbit around its planet, and we want to move it onto this elliptical orbit now. We can work out what our first velocity was on that circular orbit using our equation for the velocity on a circular orbit, right? You've done all this before. And then to work out the velocity on our elliptical orbit, we're working out what's the velocity on that elliptical orbit at the point, at the radius point, where we've applied that thrust. Yeah, so at this point here, what is your velocity? And your delta V is the difference between those two. In the case of the parabolic one, it's exactly the same thing, except that we said before, uh, when we go onto our parabolic escape trajectory, we know what our escape velocity is. So that becomes our velocity two. Our initial velocity is a velocity on our circular orbit, and the difference between those two is the delta V that we need to escape. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm now going to put you to work and ask you to actually calculate some delta V, because I think this will help make sure that you're happy with what we're talking about. So if I move on the Mentimeter... Oh, I don't know why it's magically turned into a quiz. Technology is really not my friend today. Anyway, don't worry about it. So I think we want this one. So has everyone managed to get into it? Because I think I need to let you all in before I can start the actual thing. Okay, I'm going to start it, and if people can't get in, I apologize, but still work it out for yourself. <laughs> 
Okay. There you go. So you've got two minutes now to put in what you think the answer is for what your escape velocity should be for this case. And again, feel free to chat, talk to each other, whatever you need to do. <laughs> Is it a USB C one? I think I should be okay. I've got about fifty percent. We'll see how we get. I wouldn't mind, I normally bring it and I was like, oh I won't need it because I've got it on this machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, it's all right. I've got 50%, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, but I, I think it'll be fine. But thanks. I'll shout if it starts to collapse. I don't know why it's making that noise, though. Lost the internet. Is it reopened? I tell you what, like, I don't know what's going on today. Technology is determined to just have its way with me. Okay, all right. I think. The quiz has collapsed in on itself, so I'm going to stop it there. Um, however, I can see that a couple of things have happened, which is that not everyone is quite getting the right answer, although you're pretty close, and I can see where the mistake is, so that's good. So um, the first thing to be careful of, which I think someone has done, is remember that 400 kilometers is your altitude, not your radius. Yeah? So you need to add on the radius of the Earth to get you to here, and then add on your altitude to get your radius at that point in the orbit. Okay, so that's the first thing. Don't make that mistake, that happens a lot. Okay, so always remember altitude and radius. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, which I think a few of you have done, is you've worked out what this escape velocity is, but remember that you already have an initial velocity. So this escape velocity is what you would need to give to your satellite if it was starting from zero on the surface of the Earth type thing but you're not, you already have some velocity, yeah? And so what you're actually calculating is the difference between those two. So you need to calculate this escape velocity as your V2 and this circular velocity as V1 and get the difference between them. And so the answer there should be something around three kilometers per second. So the escape velocity from Earth is about 10 kilometers a second. Low Earth orbit, you're always gonna have about seven kilometers a second. So you should be looking at about three kilometers a second. So I apologize that Mentimeter seems to collapse on me, but I'm sure you're all glad you've got off the hook, so. Okay, so yeah, so here's the, uh, the calculations. I'm not gonna dwell on them, but they're on the slide so you can look at them in your own time and check that you're happy with them. Alrighty, so that was a really simple example of how we move from one orbit to another orbit just using a single impulsive thrust blast. Bam. Uh, oh, sorry, any questions before we move on quickly? Yes. Okay, I don't know what, maybe your units were funny? So that's, I suppose, the other thing is be careful with your units. So make sure that your mu, if that's in kilometers, that your radius is in kilometers, your altitude is also in kilometers. So just make sure that your units are all consistent. Yeah? Mm -hmm. R is the radius. So yeah. why do we add the altitude to that? Why don't we put A as the major axis? So R is the, so in the case of the circular orbit, your radius is the same as the semi-major axis, right? So if we just look at this blue one here, the semi-major axis is half of that circle, so that's the same as the radius. The radius is the point from the center of the Earth to where our satellite is in that instant. If we look at our second one, 
our radius here is not the same as the semi-major axis, because in a parabola, our semi-major axis is infinite, and it heads off into the distance. Um, but our radius is just the distance from the center to where our satellite is. So it's the same value. And the reason we have to add the Earth's radius on is because the Earth's radius only gets us to the outside of that orange circle, and then we need to add on our altitude to get to where our satellite is. OK? Good. All right. So that was a very basic one where we've just taken one impulse and we've added it on. This is very rarely what we'll do, because as you saw, you can only really go from a circular to an elliptical, and if you want to move into, say, a bigger orbit, like a geo orbit, it doesn't intersect with a small circular orbit. So you need to do multiple maneuvers, generally speaking, to get where you're going. And the most common version of those is this one, which is called a Hohmann transfer. The reason we study home and transfers a lot is they are generally speaking, though not always, the most energy efficient way to move between two circular orbits. And quite often, that tends to be what we want to do. So a home and transfer is, it's not that complicated, but basically all that it is, is that if you want to get from a small circular orbit, like this blue one here in the middle, to a big circular orbit, which is this red one out here to the side, then to get between them, what you want to do is you want to create an elliptical orbit that intersects with both of them, right? Because no teleportation allowed, so you need to have one that intersects with this orbit so you can get onto it, and you want it to intersect with the outer orbit so you can get back off it again in the right place. And the reason I've dashed this line is that you could go round and round on this elliptical orbit as many times as you wanted, nothing to stop you doing it, but the fastest way would be if you just used half of that ellipse to get onto that orbit. So I think I might have animated it. So you're going around your happy orbit, and then you've got this ellipse plan. You add some delta V, which moves you onto that ellipse, right? So this is exactly what we saw before. So we've added some initial uh, thrust, this change in velocity, to put us onto this elliptical orbit like we just saw. But instead of carrying on round and round and round, when we get to this point, we add another thrust which gives us a new velocity, which will keep us on this bigger orbit. So a couple of things to keep in mind when we're doing this. The first thing is what direction do we want to be thrusting? Do we want to be speeding up or do we want to be slowing down? Remember that the more, uh, remember we're not changing position. So if we think about our energy equation, our potential energy is always staying constant through a maneuver because we're not teleporting but our velocity is changing, our kinetic energy is changing. So if we add velocity into it, if we speed up, we're going to increase our orbit energy, which means we're moving onto a bigger orbit. Our semi-major axis gets bigger. If we take energy out, if we slow ourselves down, we're decreasing the orbit energy, which means we're going onto an orbit with a smaller semi-major axis, right? So we're decreasing the size of our orbit. The way I always think about it is if we're on, say, this orbit here, and we want to move on to that elliptical one, I always imagine that when my satellite is sitting there and it's adding energy in, that the opposite side of the orbit, which is what you're kind of seeing here, goes boop, 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 right? So the more energy you add in, the bigger that opposite side of your orbit gets. And when my satellite gets around here and I decide to add in some more energy, then the other side of that yellow orbit goes boop, 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 and it ends up with the big red circular orbit. That's how I think of it. Yes? So the reason I've called those V2P and V2A is because the velocity, so V1 is the velocity that you had on your circular orbit, right? The colors are to match. I appreciate they're possibly hard to see, but the colors are to match the orbits. So velocity one is the velocity you have in your circular orbit. V2P is the velocity that you have on this elliptical yellow orbit, but at its perigee because the perigee is the point that it intersects with your circular orbit. So for this instantaneous thrust, those are the two velocities that you're jumping between. When you get around to here, V3, your velocity three, is the velocity on this big red orbit, but V2A is the velocity on your elliptical orbit, your yellow orbit, but at the apogee, so at this point. Because at that point, those are the two velocities that you're moving between. And which one is going to be greater? The velocity at the apogee or the velocity at the perigee? Perigee, excellent. Yeah, so those two numbers, V2P and V2A, are not the same number. Yeah, because you're moving slower at your apogee than you are at your perigee. 
Okay, and that's basically just what I've shown here is how you get at the total delta V for those set of maneuvers is your delta V1 and your delta V2 combined. The reason I've put them in magnitude bars is that generally speaking, when we're doing a Hohmann transfer, we're moving in the same direction, right? If we're, making, if we're moving onto a bigger orbit, we're adding velocity and we're speeding up. And if we're moving down to a smaller one, we tend to be consistently taking velocity out and hence slowing down. However, there's nothing to stop you doing a maneuver where you increase the velocity at this point and then you decrease the velocity to move down to a lower orbit. There's nothing to stop you doing that. And what you don't want to do is tell your propulsion engineer that you need a delta V of, say, let's say you do one maneuver that's two kilometers a second and one maneuver that's minus one kilometer a second because you're going in the opposite direction. You then tell your propulsion engineer you only need one kilometer a second when actually you need three. So that's why I've put those magnitude bars there, is that normally what we're interested in is how much propellant is going to take us to get there. So you don't normally want to be doing pluses and minuses because you'll end up with the wrong magnitude. Yep? No, so the shape of this trajectory is an ellipse. But you, so if we didn't apply a delta V at this point, if we didn't apply a thrust, we would just keep carrying on around into that elliptical orbit. Yeah? Anyone else? Making sense? Sort of? Okay. We're going to try this again <laughs> and see how this works out, which is to calculate the total delta V for a Hohmann transfer. So I'm not sure this is going to work, but we'll see what happens. Hopefully. I can see question three or four coming up. So fingers crossed you can all join in on the Mentimeter and put your answers in. But if nothing else, do the calculations yourself and we'll go through them in a second. Can you go on to it? Let me see if I can sort it. Again, feel free to chat. <laughs> the technology gods hate me. Okay, let's see. Who knows? Okay, all right. Hopefully there might be a thing now on Mentimeter you can answer, but... Has it now closed and stopped taking answers? <laughs> ah! Wait, if I press that button, 
Okay, we'll try it again if I give up if this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'll just give you another one minute. If it's not working, it's not working. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, show of hands if you want another couple of minutes. Okay, good, fine, carry on. Like I should have made like eight out of ten, just eight out of ten cats just count down and like hula hooped at the front or something as a distraction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. Exactly. I mean, I can't hula hoop, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, I think people have to sign in before it, and I don't know, it's getting upset anyway. I'm giving up on it. It's obviously some setting of clicked and. All right, I'll give you like 10 more seconds and then we're going to have a look at the answer. I think most people who've answered on the mentee are getting the right answer, so that gives me confidence. Okay, are we ready to take a look? Yeah. Okay, so again, these are on the slides, so you can go through them in your own time and hopefully it'll make sense, but... Basically, this is the process. So you're starting off with your satellite here at the junction of the two first orbits. And you're working out what its velocity is at that point on both of those two orbits. So what is its velocity at that point when it's on the blue circular orbit? And what's its velocity at that point when it's on the yellow elliptical orbit? And so we're calculating our circular orbit velocity using this equation. Again, we're aiming for about 7 kilometers a second because we're in a low Earth orbit. If you get something like 7,000 kilometers a second, you know you've probably got a, a zero in the wrong place or something, or a decimal point in the wrong place. And our velocity at this point on our perigee of our elliptical orbit, again, we're going to work out. So remember here that the semi-major axis that we're using is the semi-major axis of this elliptical orbit. So it's going to be this kind of distance. So it should be larger than what your radius val uh, value is. Yeah? OK? So basically, your semi-major axis here is going to be the, um, the altitude at this point plus the radius of the Earth, plus the radius of the Earth again to get you out the other side, plus the altitude at that point. Yeah, add all those up, that gets you the major axis, and you divide it by two, that gets you the semi-major axis to here. And then your radius at that point is just your distance from the center of the Earth to your satellite. And so you can work out the velocity at that point on your elliptical orbit 
subtract the two to get your delta V for your first burn. Questions on that? You are, yes, but I'm just going through it in sections. It does. Correct. Okay, yes. To get the semi major axis. Okay, so the semi major axis, can you see my mouse? Yeah? So the semi major axis is the semi major axis of this elliptical orbit, this yellow one, right? So our major axis, remember, is the full length of the ellipse. And our semi major axis is half of that full length. So to calculate what our major axis is, I add my altitude on this side, which is 400. I add the radius of my Earth, which gets me to the middle of the Earth. I add the radius of my Earth again, which gets me to the other side of the Earth. And then I add my altitude on the far side to get the full one, and then I divide it by two. So that's my two altitudes, my 400 and my 800. Clearly, my drawing is not to scale. <laughs> OK? All right. So the second bit of our maneuver then is when we're over at this point over here. So now we're at the apogee of our ellipse and we want to move on to our big circular orbit. So again, we're calculating the two velocities on the two different orbits at that point. Ah, reverse. At that point. So the velocity at our apogee on that uh, elliptical orbit is this equation here. So now our radius is from the center of the Earth out to that point. So our radius value has changed. But our semi-major axis is the same. And the velocity on our circular orbit, again, now we've got a radius out to this point, because that's where we are now on our orbit. So you can see that there's not actually a massive change in the velocities at any of those points. To get the delta v at each one, you just subtract the two, um, the two velocities. And when you add them up, you end up with 220 meters per second. Questions? No? OK. Take your time. Go through these. There'll be plenty of these kind of things in the quiz so you can get practice at it. Um, but this is the fundamentals of all of your orbit maneuvers. So the last thing I really want to cover on coplanar maneuvers, I mentioned that the reason we like Hohmann transfers is that they're generally the lowest energy transfers that we can do. There is an exception to this, which is when we want to do a massive change in semi-major axis. So if we want to go from quite a small low Earth orbit, like a 400 kilometer orbit, out to, say, the geo ring at 36,000 kilometers, it can be more efficient to do something called a bi-elliptic transfer, which looks a little bit like this. I'm not going to go through this in detail. It's in the notes if you want to go through it. But basically, instead of moving on to an elliptical orbit that touches the both um, orbits here, you're adding an extra elliptical orbit. So in this case, you've started on your little and tiny circular orbit here. You're moving on to this big elliptical orbit that goes right the way out past the orbit you want to end up on. And then you move on to another elliptical orbit, which swoops you back around to get onto the orbit that you finally want to end up on. You can technically do it this way as well with two internal ellipses. But generally speaking, to be efficient, you want something like this. Um, again, I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's just to be aware that there are alternative options out there, and sometimes a home and transfer isn't the best way to do things. But most of the time in Earth orbit and for the kind of missions we're looking at, it is. Any questions on that? And to be clear, when you calculate the delta V, it's all exactly the same. You're calculating the delta V on the two orbits at the point where you're applying your thrust, the difference between them to get the delta V, and you add them all up to get your total. OK. Right, and that is everything that I wanted to cover today, I think. Yes, I think so. I'm a little bit confused what in the world is going on with my... Um, with my lecture slides today, so we will move past it and hope that Thursday the IT gods are kinder to me. All right, um, but take your time to go through that quiz and put those things into practice because these are the kind of questions you'll see on the exam, so it's important that you're comfortable with them. All right, thank you all for your patience while I tried to battle with IT, and I'll see you all on Thursday. <laughs>
Oh, hang on. Second. Sorry, Second. we just. Ian Second. wants to say something about the class on Friday. Friday's due, Matt. It'll be easier if you, just, uh, if you look at the sheet before Friday rather than just coming to the class and start it then. There's some calculations that you can do beforehand. You might not have all the information now, but after Thursday's lecture, you will. So schedule some time this week, probably on Thursday, just to complete the calculations before the class on Friday. Did everybody hear that? So basically, for the GMAT on Friday, there'll be some work you can do ahead to make your life easier in the lab. So the stuff we're going to cover on Thursday will mean that you're able to do those calculations, so make some time to do that. All right, thanks a lot. Just about. I think this slide's missing off the end of it. Yeah, I'll have to sort it out for Thursday. Hi. Okay. So I think you've got access to the podcast recordings. Yeah, yeah, they should have everything in it. If there's anything missing, because um, we had a glitch the week before last where something didn't record properly, let me know and I can pull up the ones from last year and share them with you. No problem. Bye. I was doing so well. At least the battery survived. Anyway. But I guess that explains if there's slides missing. It must have been the ones at the end that glitched. But really knows why. So when it repaired, then it cut them out? Yeah, it just cut them out. I think that's what's happened. But um, yeah, no idea why. <laughs> just to add some stress on the Monday morning. <laughs> I know. And there, just when I thought, like, well, I think the problem is these are, I actually taught this lecture last year. So I suspect whatever I copied across from last year for some reason. Glitched it, but who knows. Right, I'm out. <laughs> I give up. Walking back. Thanks all.